Welcome to the first in a series of uh, uh, interviews with uh, authors of my favorite books where I'm going to try and pull out really what's uh, appealing about the book so that you can get a flavor for it before you dive in and also to try to draw you know what I found interesting for the pharmaceutical space so not everything's going to be directly relevant to pharmaceuticals on the surface but actually dig a little bit beneath that and the relevance to innovation in the pharmaceutical space will become clear. Um, what you're going to see in this one is actually you know one of my, one of my favorite books of like this year or maybe the last five years has been uh, Safi Bacall's Loon Shots which is just a you know absolutely recommended for essential reading for, for, for everyone. Um, uh, just some clues to what you're going to see so Safi was keen to use video. I hadn't planned on that, wasn't ready for that and uh, so if you see me looking um, uh, surprised I was getting over that shock of the, of the call starting with, uh, with, with that. Um, also there was a really interesting preamble which uh, we have uh, decided to keep because it's so interesting but it's at the end so we clipped it and moved it to the end. So if you're uh, interested in more there's more at the end, uh, and that's more sort of loose, off, uh, off, 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 off mic uh, chat, if you like. Um, so you know, watch it in that order. First uh, forty-five minutes, uh, fifty minutes or so is going to be a conversation with Safi about the book. Uh, the last five ten minutes is really a kind of broad uh, hint at really what else wasn't in the book and, and what uh, and what Safi has uh, sort of locked away in his uh, in his experience chest. So um, enjoy, dive in, and uh, hope that we see you here for a few more of these. Thanks. Um, actually, this is the first of um, of a new series of, of book uh, club uh, conversations with uh, the authors of uh, my favorite books um, on innovation, on anything uh, for frankly related. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to be talking with Safi Bacall, who um, uh, and my, my story of coming to, 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 to Loon Shots was clearly, I read everything that's written about innovation, but then I, as I dived into this, unlike every other book on innovation in the world, this had stories and it had in-depth stories about drugs that I thought I knew but didn't. Uh, and, and that would include Avastin and a bunch of other uh, really interesting, you know, classes like the starting class. Um, so I was I was surprised that there was stuff I didn't know, but actually more uh, compelled by the stories about everything. So you know, history about you know organizations, incentives, and the way that the strands were drawn together was uh, was was incredible. So. Um, so Safi, um, hi. Uh, I'd love to hear, you know, your two, three-minute kind of intro to, you know, what people can expect from Loonshots. Thanks, Mike. Glad to be on your show. Loonshots is about ultimately why good teams will kill great ideas. Good teams with excellent people and the best intentions will kill great ideas, despite what leaders and and uh, uh, managers will tell you that it's all about leadership or talent. And so it's about one idea. Now it's told through stories, as you mentioned, what connects Einstein and James Bond and Steve Jobs and the discovery of the statin and the history of Avast and the rise and fall of Pan Am and the fate of empires. But it's all connected by one idea. Why is it that groups will suddenly change behavior from being wildly enthusiastic about new ideas to rigidly rejecting them, just like a, a glass of water will suddenly change from liquid to solid. And so underlying that is an idea or a principle from physics. And uh, it's not, it sounds like it might be just a metaphor, but it's not really a metaphor. I was a theoretical physicist before I ran a biotech company. And you can actually tease out the incentives uh, inside groups and then work out kind of what that means and then see that there is a sudden transition in a group as it grows above a certain size, just like there's a sudden transition in a glass of water, water as the temperature lowers below a certain temperature. And what makes it so interesting and so important is that once you understand that transition, the forces behind that transition, you can begin to control them. For example, when it snows at night, you sprinkle salt on your sidewalk. Why? because you wanna lower the binding energy between molecules. You, wanna, you want your shoe to step in a puddle 
rather than slip and end up in the hospital. So once you understand what causes a transition, whether it's in a glass of water or inside a company, you can begin to manage it. In other words, you can begin to design more innovative teams and companies. And that's what Loonshots is about. That's awesome. Yeah, and maybe we'll come back to the teams bit because that, um, you know, because so much of this was interesting as you dive into the different kinds of strategy, the kind of, you know, the, 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 the service strategy and the product strategy, as well as a, a bunch of other things. But clearly our industry has that basic issue of, you know, pyramid hierarchies of, you know, I think you talk about this as the Moses trap. So someone at the, you know, the head of R&D or the head of commercial is your decision maker. And every idea that the company has ever had has gone through that pyramid. Um, you know, given what you've seen within our industry, do you think ours is unique or it's the same? No, you see that uh, this Moses trap is the idea or the myth that the leader, that, that a great leader should be like a Moses that stands on top of a mountain, raising his or her staff, anointing the chosen project, the chosen product, whether it's the iPod or whatever, or the right drug. And that turns out to be, as I described with a lot of other industries, but it's certainly the case that I've seen in my own experience in biomedical industry, a completely false myth. The, the truly great leaders, the ones who have built companies that can balance repeatedly delivering something great, something surprising, challenging conventional beliefs and producing something new faster and better than their competitors with operational excellence, meaning delivering products on time, on budget consistently to customers. The leaders that can do that have a different model of what it means to be a great leader. They don't see themselves as a Moses anointing the chosen project, working with a group of creatives on the one side, you know, in the tech industry, that would be, you know, the great programmers or designers or product builders in the biomedical industry, that would be the biologists and the chemists and the you know, creative physicians who are coming up with new technologies. They don't just see themselves as one or the other, as the kind of artists working on these crazy new ideas or the soldiers delivering stuff on time, on budget. They see their job as balancing the two, mm. not recognizing that these are two completely different models, two completely different systems. And they have a different model of leadership. They see themselves much more as a gardener rather than a Moses, rather than reaching deep inside the artist world to say, I think it's this molecule or it's this target or it's this pathway that's the important one and all of you others get out of the way. They create a system for nurturing lots of ideas that challenge, but specifically loon shots. Ones, what I mean by that word loon shots is that the big ideas, the one that really transform an industry rarely arrive with blaring trumpets, dazzling everybody with their brilliance. They're much more often dismissed and neglected for years or even decades. And so the, the, good le the, the leaders who succeed in repeatedly year after year in encouraging these kind of important breakthroughs don't see themselves as a Moses. Rather, they see themselves much more as tending to the balance between these artists and the soldiers, because that's a failure point of most innovation. It's in the transfer. When do you bring a baby idea out of the artist nursery into the real world and on the field? And when do you bring it back from the field and get the feedback back to the artist? Because they, you understand that the two groups don't like each other and don't understand each other. You know, and I, I talk about, you know, the, the, in, you know, the engineers or the designers and the marketers, but it's the same thing when I was running a biotech company with the biologists and the regulatory people. They don't like each other and that's okay. Yeah. They're not supposed to. You want that conflict. But as a leader, your job is not to pick the right product or pick the right pathway. The great leaders understand that their job, their main job is to manage the tension between, the, between those two groups because it's the tension between those two groups that causes most failures. And so, and of course, you want to build the best possible groups that you can. But... I think you asked me about innovation and loon shots and the, there's just so many examples from the drug discovery world, uh, some of which I you know mentioned in loon shots, but so many others 
where the ideas were dismissed for years or decades. I think you mentioned VEGF and Avastin and the angiogenesis inhibitors. Not many people know, and there's so much revisionist history in this field as well. It's, sure, just, it's yeah. just incredible. I, I remember we were talking to a, a Nobel laureate recently who should have known better, who is responsible for some famous prizes in biomedical, but was pretty stunned to discover the real history. You know, Judah Folkman worked, uh, came up with the idea for VEGF, and not only did he uh, promote and uh, successfully pursue the idea for 32 years, despite widespread criticism and ridicule, his, he was asked to resign as chief of surgery if he wanted to continue the research because his own institution had doubts about it. He was, you know, had his grants rejected, his papers rejected. But he also built so much of the apparatus and the tools and the techniques that were eventually used by researchers in the late 90s to actually isolate and clone uh, VEGF. It was, it was kind of remarkable. Um, but so many of these ideas, the statin class, again, a pretty revisionist history from one large mm. company that we know well. Mm. But what really happened was that the scientists in Japan kept pursuing this idea for a decade after being told that lowering cholesterol was a ridiculous pursuit because, you know, dietary trials of cholesterol had failed. Other cholesterol inhibitors had failed. His his molecule didn't work in mouse models, but he kept persisting. Uh, so most of these ideas that become, of course, the statin class has cumulative sales of just uh, roughly a third of a trillion dollars. Right. And that was shot down and rejected by essentially every major pharma company. The one that persisted was because Akira Endo in Japan kept giving them the information about why it should work and why it wasn't working in the mouse models and why you should try a chicken model and so on and so forth. The interferons, of course, you know, that was, nobody had any belief that that would, after it was a big hype for cancer, no one thought it could do anything because it had failed in so many trials. No one had guessed that the interferons might do something for multiple sclerosis. But of course, boom, $10 billion a year later, interferons pretty successful class for multiple sclerosis. Yeah. Over and over in our industry, let's take, for example, I don't know if you, you remember, but uh, so many of the pharmas dismissed rheumatoid arthritis as a, you know, the TNF alpha inhibitors yep. uh, as a class. They said, oh, it's a disease of old ladies. How big is that market? Well, you know, $20 billion a year, <laughs> <laughs> at least that's a pretty big market. Uh, you know, even going back to uh, Amgen and Epijet, you know, it was Everybody, right. you know, the whole team inside Amgen was trying to kill that project. They were doing chicken growth hormones when they started so many other things. And it was just barely kept alive and just barely managed to succeed in funding. And then Amgen was near bankruptcy. I remember Fred Frank, the, their banker, was trying to sell them to anybody. Yeah. Nobody would buy them. Yeah. Nobody would buy them. And this was like pennies on the dollar because they said, that's a tiny. OK, so you made. You succeeded in cloning human erythropoietin, but so what? It's for end-stage kidney disease. So what? How many patients are that? That's nothing. Yeah. Okay, well, again, $10 billion a year in revenue later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the lesson there is you nurture loon shots to challenge accepted beliefs. You want to be very careful of a leader, a Moses, saying, well, I don't think that's a big market. Almost right. all the important breakthroughs came from stuff that people didn't think was a big market. Yeah, and, and that um, history should be telling us something, right? Which is uh, the kind of role of serendipity. And, and you know, we've talked a lot internally about the kind of this kind of what we call planned serendipity. So planning for finding out and learning rather than to try to predict, because we know that prediction doesn't work and. Uh, you know, and you look at something like the amino oncology class at the moment with Octavio and Keytruda, neither of which were part of, you know, the, the plans 10 years ago at either of those companies, but stayed alive for whatever reason. Um, the, the You talk a lot in the book about incentiveology, if you like, the kind of chief incentives officer idea of thinking about how to incentivize getting what you want. And given that there's a need to think about serendipity, 
And given that you have the silos that you describe, um, you know, one of the challenges that we see is, you know, it's easy to incentivize uh, your regulatory people to just say no, because you'll never get dinged for saying no. You might get dinged for saying yes and, and following a risky strategy. And then they're, they're aligned vertically, right? So they have that issue. They don't necessarily want to make any particular drug their own success in in, in the sense of getting it to that $10 billion a year. So how do you, you, you explore some very intriguing sort of, you know, mathematical models of incentives within the book? How would you kind of describe that, you know, for us simply uh, next to the pharmaceutical space? Well, that's a sign that you really read the book as I, I tried to bury uh, with my publisher's <laughs> urge. I tried to bury and hide the math underlying mathematical model in physics and science. Didn't say right I understood it. Right in the end, in like an appendix, you know, I had to like twist my publisher's arm to allow me to include an equation. But, uh, and it's funny in the end, you know, people kind of enjoy the fact that you can have a hard science approach to what people normally talk about with very soft, right. squishy psychology. But anyways, you're absolutely right. I, re this, I remember one, one uh, time I was at a dinner. I won't mention who it was or what company, but we were in the discussing a very large partnership. We were, you know, a pretty small biotech company with a cancer drug and it was a very large pharma. And I uh, went to meet for dinner, the head of R&D. And I remember, you know, just talking about, should we work together and the potential for the drug and our, did we have the similar vision for it? And I remember at one point he said, he was talking about killing drugs. And I remember he said, if people don't get it, you know, people talk about, oh, you know, you need to be bold to kill a project. So people just don't understand. It's really easy to kill a drug. It never comes back to bite you. Right. End of story. It's much harder to keep a, a project going in the face of a failed clinical trial. And you're absolutely right. And, and, and you know, of course, as the head of R&D of a major pharma company, he understood that very well. And it comes down to incentives. If you kill a good drug, you won't be fired for that because it's never going to come and disprove you that it was a bad decision. Because, you know, let's say even it's one of a class and your competitor develops another one in our industry and by in, in drug discovery, you can't really prove that yours would have worked just as well. You just, you just never know. The CTLA fours were a good example of that. The PD one inhibitors are a good example of that the statins are good. You know, even if something is in the same class, very small differences can make uh, an enormous yeah. difference. Yeah, versus Celebrix, yeah. Via just yeah. small changes yeah. in actually clinical trial design and who you include or not, you make a huge, anyway. Yeah. The point being that in, it is very, very tricky to get incentives right. It is so tricky, it's really surprising that we have company, and I talk well outside the pharma industry, you know, some leading investment banks, leading media companies who want to see themselves as a, as a technology company now. And they have 21st century operations. Well, it's, you know, and I'm just, you know, might be a phenomenal regulatory or marketing group or in a banking industry, you might have a phenomenal uh, execution group. And they may have 21st century uh, uh excellent technologists or scientists coming up with new ideas, but they have 19th century incentive systems. They reward, let's say in banking, you want to evolve. I'm just going to talk about a different industry because it, it becomes more interesting in how you can translate that. So I'm talking to a very well-known uh, investment bank and they're talking about how they want to, you know, they hire, they hire these fantastic uh, technologists by paying them a ton of money. And then they have these fantastic traders and wealth managers that makes them a lot. But the technologists come up with all these new technologies. But if you keep paying your traders and your bankers based on that month's commissions, yeah, what are they going to do? They're yeah. going to ignore those technologists. So you can hire all the best people you want, mouth all the best things that you want. But if you keep, if you don't think about upgrading your incentive systems as strategically as you think about your financial decisions or your R&D decisions or your product decisions or your people decisions, which is the case. Most people don't think about that. If you don't think about that, you're missing a big 
part of what happens to teams and companies. So we started with why do good teams kill great ideas? Well, why does a glass of water change from solid to liquid as you lower the temperature? There's no CEO molecule. There's no CEO molecule with a thermometer and saying, hey, everybody, it's 33 degrees. So everybody, you guys should all just be sloshing around, be super liquid. Oh, wait a minute. It's 31. Everybody line up. No, wait a minute. It's 33. There's no CEO molecule telling them what to do. Similarly, if you take a block of ice, no amount of yelling by a CEO at those molecules. Hey, guys, just loosen up a little bit. Be more innovative. Be more fluid. Nothing is going to melt that. None of that, no amount of that yelling or holding hands or singing kubaya is going to get that group to change behavior, but a small change in temperature can get the job done. That's what's understanding the incentives matters. Understand if you, if you focus too much on just cultural stuff and holding hands and singing kumbaya, I know that's a little blasphemy, but really there's just some, I went, you know, as a CEO for 13 years, public company, I'd be reading, it was like you, I'm reading all these books to try to learn how to be a better manager and leader. After a couple of years, I just, I kind of had enough because they all sounded the same. I was, you know, celebrate victories, blah, 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 and power employee. You know, after the 500th time of reading that, it's like, all right, I got it. You know, celebrate victories and power employee. But, you know, <laughs> you want something a little harder core, right? So a little more science, a little more substance to it. And that's kind of what miss, what's missing is if you get all the, you know, pat everybody on the back and celebrate victory stuff right, but you've got incentive wrong, it doesn't matter. It's just like the same thing with the glass of water. Just keep talking to those molecules. It's not going to make them loosen up. You have to understand the forces at work at individual models. Because when you leave the room, when the CEO leaves the room and you're at a committee meeting discussing a new drug project and he's pounding his head, he's excited. Well, if the incentives are wrong, it doesn't matter. The two groups that need to work together to get that drug over the finish line when the CEO leaves the room, they're just not going to cooperate if the incentives are wrong. And yeah. that's why that's why I talk about the need for people who are strategic about a head of R&D, chief technology officer, chief product officer. In our industry, it's called the you know head of R&D. They're, they're strategic about you know what gadgets do they equip all their employees with. That's the chief technology officer. Who cares if you have the latest iPhone? Don't you want, you know, so that you have a, a workforce with the best gadgets in the industry? Who gives a sh- you know, Who cares? I, I don't know if your show's R-rated or not. I can say those words, but whatever. We'll figure it out later. Who, who you know, who cares if they have the latest iPhone or not? Who's the most, is the, the fanciest gadget workforce in the industry? Wouldn't you rather have the most motivated workforce in the industry? Where the incentives are most aligned with what really drives your industry? That's a really hard problem. Imagine any, and not just our industry, but, you know, how do you align bankers and technologists? One group that has a several year vision for how to completely transform the company and the other that's being paid on sales that month or sales that quarter. How do you align them? That's a very tricky problem. And it's not just financial, it's psychological. What's really motivating them? All the recent work in behavioral economics and behavioral science that is, you know, of course, it's financial is one element, but there are non-financial elements that are equally important. What are those? Well, those are very tricky subjects. Shouldn't we be as strategic about use of incentives and what's really driving behavior among employees, like a chief incentives officer? Shouldn't we be as strategic about that problem as we are about making sure each employee has the latest gadget with a chief technology officer? So uh, that's why I talk about a chief incentives officer. and That's why I talk about the job of the leader, if you want to drive continual sustainable innovation, you want to balance mm-hmm. operational execution with creating new ideas and technologies that really challenge accepted wisdom, you need to think much more strategically at a much higher level about balancing the tension between you know, these two kinds of groups inside a company. Yeah, and, it, and, it's an, and it's an interesting challenge for our industry, right? But just because of that potentially 40-year life cycle from revenue to, you know, uh, discovery to revenue uh, as a feedback loop. And people talk about that difficulty of, you know, how would you properly assess 
productivity within our industry of, you know, is it about candidates? Is it about the number of, you know, successful phase threes or, and, and you know, recognize that kind of challenge. I just want to loop back to something that you said about uh, the, the failures, right? So it's easy to kill because no one's going to, you say, it never comes back to bite you. Um, you know, what we see is this kind of huge trash heap of, of probably good medicines killed by bad studies. Um, you know, I'd be interested in you. I don't think you covered this in the book, but the, but that, that kind of idea of um, of revisiting, you know, so, some of that stuff with different thinking. Th th does that sound like it would be self-evidently a good idea? It's it comes straight back to an incentive problem. So imagine you are. Of course, it's a good idea. If you, in general, you want to nurture those crazy ideas that challenge beliefs and try to gather more and more data. So you want to make rational decisions. The problem is the personal agencies create an irrationality to it that becomes not scientific. For, here's what I mean by that. Let's say you have drug project A that has a one in 10 chance of success like most phase one products. And then you have drug project B on this. I, I've seen so many times in industry as have you as so many friends and colleagues have been there which failed in a phase three trial, as an example. Um, but that being said, so many good drugs failed in their first, you know, Avastin failed in its first phase three. So many important drug categories failed in their first phase three trial. However, let's say you're the person deciding between A and B, and one has already failed, and your colleagues at other large pharma firms are abandoning that drug class because of that failure, which they did with VEGF, by the way. Everybody abandoned VEGF except for Genentech. And mm -hmm. Genentech was ready to throw in the, it just happened that they had, it. you know, what made it really work for them is they were spending Roche's money, as you know. Because uh, <laughs> of the deal that the uh, friends at Genentech were pretty straightforward about this, because they really weren't paying for the trial. Right. Because Roche was eating so much of the cost. So they were looking ways to spend more money. They happen. Because of that, they ran two large phase three trials, big ones, uh, which at the time was unusual. Today, that's much more common. But at the time, we have to rewind back to you know the late 90s. That was a little more uncommon for an untested product. And their first trial, uh, first phase three trial in metastatic breast cancer failed. And at that point, even the guy who was kind of the chief product champion, which is Napo Ferreira of Vastin inside Genentech and the science side, you know, he'd kind of given up hope because there'd been so many failures, but they had this other colon cancer trial growing, which turned out to be positive in the end. Yeah. So yeah. back to your question, Matt, there's a personal incentives issue, which is drug A is some shiny new target that the industry is excited about, but has never made it to phase three. And drug B has already made it to phase three, but failed once. And your colleagues are abandoning that class. Well, which one are you going to go? Yeah. Even if realistically they both have one in 10 sh shots. Scientifically, you should be they should be equally attractive from a probability right. of success perspective. But you won't. Yeah. You will go for the shiny new one that your other friends are jumping on as well. Because your job is safer that way. Because yeah. if you promote, if you advocate in a committee meeting going forward with the a drug that's failed, you might lose your chance at a promotion. They'll think, what's wrong with this guy? And then they're yeah. gonna pass over you. Yeah. Whereas the other person who's promoting drug A, they'll say, well, yeah, you know what? I think that sounds like the future, it's shiny. The future is shiny, so let's go with that guy. No, also, he's sort that. of witty and he's sort of funny. So the problem is not with a rational assessment of the pure scientific probability. That's of course one thing you wanna get right. But there is a very strong issue with understanding incentives. And that's not a simple problem. Yeah. It's not like, oh, well, here's the five second answer. Yeah. On the other hand, our industry is full of not simple problems. But that, that's you why know, we don't like it, right? Manufacturing a protein drug, not a simple problem. <laughs> it yeah. took about a yeah. decade to figure right. out how to manufacture with GMP quality a protein drug. So you know what? Incentives are also not a simple problem. But most companies, large corporate companies, have 19th century practices there. Hmm. Why? 
because it's difficult. It, it involves actually difficult human emotions. You know, if you're going to increase, if you're going to do something non-standard, the simplest thing to do, having been a CEO and of a public company, and you have these industry metrics like Radford data and surveys that tell you what is a fair compensation, the thing to do is some buddy comes to you and says, I want more or less, you put them to their HR guy who opens a book and says, this is your bracket and you're, you know, here in the bracket. Okay, done. Everybody go away. Mm -hmm. Well, now your problem is solved. It took you one minute. You can go and worry about other things. Mm -hmm. But is that going to be a really motivated player? Probably not. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we're applying the same level of strategy and insight about how to properly motivate our employees. And that's at the root cause of why good teams kill great ideas. Yeah, which is interesting because, you know, theoretically we're a scientific industry, but you say there's a bunch of things which are deeply human and uh, irrational in that in that piece. Um, you, you talk in the book about kind of, you know, franchise empires. Uh, could you el elaborate on, because I think Farmer is, is a really nice model of kind of franchise empires and their unsuitability for the kind of innovation that we're looking for. Well, here, it gets exactly to the heart of what we're talking about, which is, I, I mentioned, we talked about a glass of water. So yeah. groups will behave as a result of, they will suddenly shift behavior as a result of two competing forces on those molecules. Not what any one leader will tell them. You know, in a glass of water, you have one force, you know, is binding energy, wants to lock molecules in place. Another is entropy that wants to make them run around and be free. And it's a competition between those two forces that drives the change in behavior. As you change certain parameters of the system, the, the, the relative balance suddenly shifts and one side wins. And the same thing in a team or a company, whenever you have, you create a reward system that's tied to a mission, you create these two competing forces. You know, your one is related to perks of rank and hierarchy, and the other is related to equity or stake and outcome. Those are the two competing forces that will always happen whenever teams assemble into a group. And it's the sudden shift between these two forces that causes good teams, previously teams that were previously good, to suddenly start rejecting important new ideas. The same people, just like the mm -hmm. same molecule switch. So the question is, the real problem there is the following. The problem is that there are these two phases. Because the problem is, if you, as soon as you're more than five people or 10 people, you need both. You need both as a company and you need both as an industry. Our industry at the meta level needs franchises because they bring in the income that pays for the very high risk and the very high failure rate of loon shots. Just like the film, and I actually got the word franchise from both drug industry and film yeah, industry. Yeah. We need the next Avengers. We need the next Transformers. We need the next Batman. We need the next James Bond. You probably see the kind of movies that I like. We need, we <laughs> need those... Was. We need those franchises if we want the next Juno, the next My Big Fat Greek Wedding, the next, because if we just had A or B, the industry, the film industry would die. Eventually, up to the 10th or 20th or 50th or 100th Marvel movie, the the public will, will have had enough. Yeah. Just like if we didn't have that income, you couldn't sustain an industry on Juno and My Big Fat Greek Wedding alone. Yeah. Yeah. So you need both, and a company to survive needs both. You need the next statin drug, the next ulcer drug, the next VEGF inhibitor, because there is a market and demand for it, and patients will pay for an incrementally safer drug, which is important. But you also need balloon shots. Now, the problem, the fundamental problem with this idea that there are two phases is a system cannot be in two phases at the same time. Right. Water cannot be liquid and solid at the same time. How is that possible? It doesn't make any sense. Every now and then I give this talk and someone will raise their hand and say, what about a Slurpee? And so just for the record, a Slurpee is a liquid, a disgusting sugary liquid in which are suspended particles of ice that are rapidly melting. If you wait five minutes, it will be all disgusting sugary liquid. What I mean is you can't, a system can't be in two phases at the same time sustainably yeah. in equilibrium. 
with one exception. And that's what we mean by you asked about franchises and loon shots. And that's what I mean. Either you're good at the next stat and the next also drug, the next, those are easy to sell up committee meetings, easy to run the large clinical trials, easy to do the operations because everybody's done it before, easy to think about what the FDA will anticipate because everybody's done it before. Just like the next Avengers or the next James Bond is relative, you know, the next James Bond, you just, you, you need a, a good looking dude, you need a, a damsel in distress, you need a, you know, a, 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 a double crosser right in the middle, and you need a couple of witty what do you think for Bond to say? And you're done. Yeah. There you go. You have a Bond movie. Yeah. Uh, just like that. Those are the franchises. And there's a reason the large companies are good at that. And the small companies can't do that. And that's important. But if the larger companies want to succeed, they have to do both. And a system can't be in two phases at the same time. So how do you solve that problem? Well, there's one exception to the rule. Right at 32 Fahrenheit, there is a state in which loon shots and fran in liquid and solid coexist, two phases coexist at the same time, right on the cusp of the phase transition, two states can exist at the same time. That gets back to what we were talking about in the beginning, which is your job, and that's a balance between those two phases. That's maintaining a very delicate balance between those two fairs, between the artists and the soldiers, between the liquid and the solid, life at 32 Fahrenheit. And that gets right back to what we're talking about. What is the job of a leader? And I sometimes get asked that if you said, well, you know, if I can't yell at the block of ice to melt, then what is, what, you know, it's going to be solid or liquid, but depending on these various other things, and what's my job? Why do I have a role at all? That's the point. The job of the leader is to maintain life at 32 Fahrenheit. The job of the leader is to maintain that delicate balance between the two. This sounds like a simple thing or a super, but it, there's, as you know, a lot more detail about exactly what I mean by that. How do you separate the phases, design different system, design different incentives, because they are two different objectives. One wants high risk and low quality. The other wants low risk and high quality. They're exactly opposite. When you're yeah. nurturing wound shots, you want pilots as fast as possible, as many as possible to learn fast as possible. When you are injecting a patient or manufacturing a drug or delivering a, a television to a customer, you want high quality and low failure rates. You don't want to deliver the television set to his bathroom. You, you, know, you don't want to get the quality wrong on your GNP and what, the drug that you're manufacturing. And that other side of the operation is the franchise operation. You need to run your large trials well. You need to manufacture your products well. That's the franchise. So the job of the leader is to manage the balance between loon shots and franchises, to recognize that those two sides of the organization are totally different. They don't like each other. They don't speak the same language. They don't understand each other. And that's normal. That's mm. healthy. You want that. You mm. don't want artists to be soldiers and soldiers to be artists. That would be wrong. Your job, though, is to manage the transfer between mm. those. Two. So, there, you know, that there's a lot more specifics well, to that yeah, but yeah. uh that's kind of the gist of it that they're loon shots they're franchises your job is to manage the touch and the balance between those two yeah and i think you make a reference in the book to you know efficiency systems which are it, it almost set up to kill innovation and, and i think you know the industry is going through this kind of phase of you know agile rather than agility you know they're they're bringing in the wrong thing to do the right thing um without actually recognizing which problem they're solving for and i think it's easy to see if you can improve things incrementally by one percent two percent that you think something is going to come out the other side of it but there there is that issue of uh, of uh, you know basic uh, have we set the incentives up to to, to 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 fail and get in the way of, of of what we're doing something i wanted to loop back to is something i just touched on really early uh, was uh, I'd like to hear you kind of talk about S and P with, uh, with, with, with kind of reference to, 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 to our industry, because I think it's an industry in phase transition. It's, you know, we've been used to launching drugs and pricing them wherever we wanted and not having to think about service or strategy or, you know, how we get them to patients. Um, tell us a little bit more about the distinction that you draw in the book. Sure. All right. So we just talked about one kind of job as the leaders to manage this balance between loon shots and franchises in certain interesting ways. But another job 
is to mal- manage the balance between the types of loon shots. So let's just talk about that for a second. There's uh, small and large. There's, you know, what I would call speedboats and helicopters. Let's say, you know, if you think about, for example, you have a core franchise as a battleship that's zooming down some lane in the ocean. Let's say you're Google. Just to step outside our industry a little bit, it can be kind of refreshing yep. to step a little bit. Let's say you're Google. Your core franchise, your battleship, a few years ago was searching text. And somebody comes up with an idea, let's search images. Well, I'd call that you know, kind of a speedboat, exploring some adjacent lanes. Mm-hmm. But now let's say somebody comes up with, I don't know, how about we build a mobile phone operating system? Now, that's a helicopter. You're exploring very, very different lands. Or let's say, we, well, let's build an email application. That has nothing to do with, seemingly nothing to do with searching text. But guess what? Most email applications at the time did not search very well. And one thing Google meant to do was how to search. So that's where they got searched. Those are helicopters. So one kind of balance that you want is between the small and the large, between the speedboats and the helicopters. You need both. You know, if you have a good statin drug, you kind of want to improve that statin drug. Or if you have how you price it or how you uh, deliver it to customers or how you market, you want to keep making those improvements before your competitors do. Otherwise, you'll lose your franchise. But you also want to be exploring exploring the more distant lands, the helicopters. So that's one kind of balance. But the one that you mentioned is really sort of fascinating, has been fascinating to me. And that's where our industry, uh, the biotech, biomedical, pharma, drug discovery, falls in so much the same trap that I see with uh, the tech industry, tech companies, CEOs that I speak with, leadership teams that I talk to. And that is a focus on product, 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 Mm -hmm. one type of innovation. So you can think about broadly two types of innovation, two types of loon shots. The P type, the product types, are the technologies that people say will never work. Oh, the transistor, you can never make a switch out of a solid semiconductor device. That's absurd. You need a filament and blah, blah, blah. Well, (laughs) probably the biggest invention of the 20th century. You know, that's not the case. Or the telephone and the personal computer, the CCD chip, digital camera, all of those are product type innovations, the jet engine, for example. Another one, a different one is a strategy or strategy type, which involves no new innovations. For example, 32 year old guy who likes sales, likes to sell shoes, t-shirts, and he wants to open a a store. That's his kind of ambition. And uh, where's he going to go? Well, he's going to go a big city because that's where you get the most foot traffic that's where the people are that's where you're going to sell stuff his wife happens to say uh well honey uh i'm happy to support you but i'm not going to live in a big city has to be a town less than ten thousand people and this fellow says decides that he likes not only sales but he likes being married so he goes ahead and he moves to a town he also actually likes quail hunting so he picks a little town that's sort of in a right in the U.S. where there are four states that come together in a point, and each one of them has a different season for quail hunting. And that little town is called Bentonville, Arkansas, and the guy's name is Sam Walton. And he opens a store, and all of a sudden, it explodes. Walmart essentially wipes out the rest of the industry. Right. Today, it would be like the number 25 in the world by GDP if it was a, uh, yeah. if it was a country. No new technologies just a small shift in strategy. He relocated where everybody said you couldn't relocate. He went into rural towns far from a major city and discovered, and this is part of the important lesson there, loon shots, the market there was far bigger than anyone, including himself, had ever been. That's the lesson about trying to kill projects early. If you have a marketing type leadership that looks at market assessments, it's kind of the worst thing that you could do for innovation in in an is a, get, tell me your market assessment. You could just write off that company. End yeah. of story. Get a, buy a graveyard. It's all yeah. over. Which it's, is every pharma company. Right? Yeah. Almost. You know, there are a few yeah. few ones that I know that don't that ha, have been very thoughtful about that. Uh, I don't want to mention any names, but there are few ones. Some of whom have their R and D headquarters here in the Boston area that have actually pretty well absorbed that lesson and try to nurture loon shots regardless of their initial sales element. They've learned the lesson of epigen or rituxin or interferon or 
all of these drugs that started off as, oh, my God, if that eats, gets 10 million in sales, I'll eat my hat. Yeah. Literal statement from pretty much any of them. The sales were about a factor of 1,000 X, of course, yeah. Of, yeah. of what they thought. So there's some companies, that thought that, but the point was, that's an estimate. We're talking about the two types, the estimate. Sam Walton's thing, Walmart's thing, no new technology, just a small shift in strategy. So I'll give you an example where this made the difference between a company that succeeded and thrived and a company that was world famous that went bankrupt. And it's especially relevant to our industry. It's sort of fun telling stories from other industries because you can mm -hmm. some, learn, especially if you've been in one industry for a long time. So that's the aviation industry. So well, and it's particularly relevant because it's a very heavily regulated industry like the biomedical industry. And it's particularly sensitive to regulatory shocks as the biomedical industry yeah. is. Uh, so in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, by far the number one airline in the world and the most famous brand in the world, number two after Coca-Cola, was Pan Am. It was, you know, James Bond rode Pan Am, 2001, the movie was, you know, based on a Pan Am spaceship. Uh, the Beatles arrived from the uh, England and the U.S. In pan, on, on a Pan Am ship and gave their first press conference. It was, you know, Pan Am pilots were like rock stars. Pan Am stewardesses were like, or they just made a TV show about Pan Am stewardesses. You don't really hear that yeah, about, yeah. you know, United yeah. Airlines stewardesses. Right? <laughs> right? You know, it was, it was this incredible brand and they were by far the dominant airline but guess what the leader it was a very much a founder a ceo driven kind of a moses trap organization the founder Juan trip had taken it for those 30 or 40 years and was very much the moses on the top of the mountain and he was a p-type innovator product 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 he introduced the world to jet commercial jet airlines mm -hmm. he made it happen that the, nobody believed commercial jets could be successful. That's sort of a longer story. But he is sing, single, almost single-handedly introduced the jet age into the world and brought the old world and the new world together, made international travel affordable for uh, the masses. And he kept focusing on product, 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 product. Oh, well, the 707, I was the first commercial jet airline that was a huge success so let's build a bigger engine the 737 oh that's really good too the 727 the 730 now let's build another one the 747 oops oops really expensive meanwhile a competitor not very well known much less grammars because product 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 is an easy thing to point to strategy stuff is much harder more subtle much more mm. difficult to wrap your mind around and talk about but a guy at another airline, Bob Crandall and American Airlines, who didn't know anything about engines. Trip was a, a pilot experience, an engine experience. He designed planes, like to get his, 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 uh, he had oil in his blood was the phrase. Right. Uh, this guy, Bob Crandall, worked at Hallmark Cards before. He'd worked in banking before. He was a finance guy. He didn't know anything about, you know, the airline business, or at least he wasn't, you know, a pilot engineer. But he was smart about, strategy he came up with an idea you know one of you oh what about something called frequent flyers hmm. mm -hmm. there we go or what about you know we're efficiency like we're flying direct everywhere nonstop. what about if we made a hub and spoke model where we picked a couple hubs and we just flew out of those hubs wouldn't that lower cost yes what about lower turnaround times wouldn't that improve he kept focusing on these little things while but while uh, Juan Tripp at Pan Am was focusing on bigger, faster, better product, bigger, faster, better product, he was looking at all these weird little strategies. And here's kind of one. There's several more that are a little more difficult and subtle. But here's one. How about we take the reservation system that we all use internally in our airlines? And here's kind of a crazy idea. Let's give it away for free to every travel agent in the world. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, you can't do that. Why not? I'm going to do it. And I just did. And he did it. That became the Sabre system. It was American Airlines travel system. And guess what? American Airlines share of travel went up, up, up. There was no new technology involved. It was just a, a weird strategic decision that no everybody thought was crazy. And he just did it. Big regulatory shock, airline deregulation. 
Guess who survived and guess who went bankrupt? Yeah. Pan Am yeah. went bankrupt. American Airlines, which had none of the glamour product inventions of Pan Am, none at all, but had these very subtle strategic shifts that turned out to be very important, but much harder to write about. I tried to put on a magazine cover. American became essentially the only airline not to go bankrupt out of 300 300 airlines. So lesson of that story is there's so much focus. And I talked to a lot of tech companies, so much focus in tech companies about bigger, faster, better computer, bigger, faster, better engine, bigger, faster, better code, you know, blah, 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 blah. And they rarely think about the small shift in strategy like, how do we get this, you know, what partner should we work with? Is there like a, that doesn't do anything about the technology? Maybe we should, what can we license? Which new ways to reach more customers can we think about creatively that involve no new product whatsoever? Mm. And most, because most tech leaders grow up, like for example, the early Steve Jobs thinking it's all about product, 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 product. And in, that myth gets perpetuated with, you know, magazine covers holding up, you know, this Steve Jobs as this great product visionary. Oh, he thought of the iPod or the iPhone. And that's not really what happened, as he would be one of the first to tell you. Yeah. You know, what ha- of course, they did come up with new products. He led much less like the Moses myth and much more of the gardener. He brought in. Of course, he promoted Johnny Ive when he first took, came back to Apple. He promoted Johnny Ive uh, to be his chief kind of artist. And then he brought in Tim, a guy named Tim Cook, who in his previous right. job was known as the Attila the Hunt of inventory. And if there's a better name for a soldier inside a company, I don't know it. And he led more by balancing those two mm. rather than favoring one or the other. The, when it, at his first stint at Apple, it was exactly the opposite. He talked about the artists working on the Mac and all those bozos working on the franchise, which was the Apple III and so forth. You know, it was a disaster. People think it was this great victory, but actually it was a, a total disaster. The, the hostility was so great during his first stint at Apple that the street between their two buildings, those working on the loon shots like the Mac and those working on the franchise like the Apple III, that street between their building was called the DMZ. <laughs> Militarized zone, mm-hmm. and the guys working on the franchise took to wearing uh, 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 these uh, plastic buttons with a picture of Bozo the Clown and a red circle and a sash. We're not bozos. That's exactly the lesson for how you don't mm-hmm. want to manage it. And of course, when the Mac launched, it, it had a great Super Bowl ad, but the product was a flop. It overheated. It was too slow. Sales tanked, and the franchise yeah. tanked, and Apple nearly went under. Yeah. But when he came back, he managed the two. And people think, oh, he was this great product innovator, but actually his most critical decisions were strategy decisions. He went in and he said, you know what? There are all these clones. I want you guys, the board, to write a $100 million check and buy them all out of their contracts. They said, you're crazy. Everybody says that's the wrong strategy, that you've got to be, you know, people want freedom. And he said, no, I don't think that's the right. I want to try a different strategy. And then... This in the height of music piracy, mm. the Napster days and everybody putting, he said, I want to charge 99 cents a song. Yeah. And people said there was no technology. Everybody had stuff in the cloud and there was streaming. He just said, I want to try a different strategy. People said, well, that, that wasn't a product thing. It was a strategy. So the moral of the story is there are these two types, mm. product and strategy. And in our, in the biotech, the biomedical, the drug discovery industry, we spend so much time. I did. I was certainly guilty of that as a as a leader. And then about let's talk about the product properties. You know, how mm-hmm. what is this data? What is that data? Product versus our competitors' product data. And as you said, I think it's an inflection point for the industry. There are a lot of things that are changing really fast, and maybe it's time to start thinking about what's the equivalent of the S type change. Mm-hmm. What's the equivalent of Bob Crandall saying? hey, you know what? Here's a crazy idea. Let's give our reservation system away to every travel agent in the industry mm. for free. Mm. What are the completely strate- new ways of thinking about how you partner or how you uh, work with insurance companies or how you work with the FDA or how you work on pricing models or how you work on with your competitors? Mm. Uh, 
you know, there's so much pooled data that would benefit everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Ahead. Yeah, and, and I think that's, and I know that um, we're way over your time. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the Steve Jobs thing was was interesting because I think with uh, with Tim Cook, he gave him credit around the launch of the iPad. He said, look, any other company, we could have made an iPad and they would have launched it for three and a half thousand dollars. Um, this guy allowed us to make it and sell it at a profit for six hundred dollars, and that was the secret to the iPad success. And they go, well, actually, our industry, unfortunately, is still selling, you know, still creating three and a half thousand dollar iPads and hoping that uh, they're going to change things. So I, I think you're exactly right. Um, but I think you know your stories and the and the sort of depth with which you tell them and the kind of the novel insights, because um, say looping back to the intro. Um, this wasn't a regurgitation because I think so many books are regurgitations of, of what someone's read in a different innovation book, but your uh, deep insights and the, I think, as you said, before we started rolling the tape, there's a, there's a hundred others that you could have included that you didn't, uh, because that would have been a pharma geeks book oh, rather, yeah. than a, rather than an innovation, uh, uh, kind of, uh, generalist book. Um, is there anything that you wish that I'd asked you just before we sign off, Safi? Uh, you know, I might tell, I, I used to work with a guy named, with Judah Folkman, as I think I mentioned when we were talking, and there was a phrase that, um, uh, there are a couple of things that, uh, stayed with me from working with Judah, um, in the last years of his life. And one of them was, I, I asked him, how did you persist? How did you persist for 32 years? you know, from when you first had that idea and people were ridiculing it and people, you know, you would go to a conference and he, and as Judas said, everybody would suddenly get up and walk out of the room when I stood up to talk as if everybody had to go to the bathroom at once. Uh, and I asked him, how did you persist for 32 years? And he, I don't know, you know, one thing he told me is that, well, you can always tell a leader from the arrows in his ass. And that, that, that one, that was, that was interesting, but I, I remember asking this again because it was just such an interesting thing. And the final thing he told me uh, on that question about all these experts said it could never work that way. You know, you could never have a product that does this. No one would ever pay for it. He said uh, to me, there are no experts of the future. Mm -hmm. And I always keep that in mind when I'm pursuing my own loon shots. I mean, this book was, you know, a crazy idea. Who wants, who's going to, is there going to be a market for a book on the intersection of physics, business, and history? No way. That's absurd. Well, that's what all the, the people who were sure they knew the future predicted, but yeah, yeah. That, that's wrong. Well, wonderfully. Thank you for that. And, you know, I'm hoping that there's a, that there's a follow-up pretty soon. Um, Safi, thank you so much. Uh, I will, uh, I'll include all of the, the, the kind of connection details and the contact details so people can find you uh, uh, online. I encourage you to do that. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, anyone who is curious can go to loonshots.com and see all the latest stuff. Wonderful. Thank you so right, much. Thanks Safi. a lot, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Much of a drug discovery book. I told this the, the story of Judah Folkman and Vegf. Mm -hmm from so much of the unknown history, which is an incredible story. Also the story yeah. of thalidomide, which is an incredible story, and cell gene. Yeah. yeah. So I heard a lot, a lot from Saul Barra and John Jackson personally, and a lot of the person. And it was just uh, a few, you know, a few technical early readers liked yeah. it as my biomedical friends. But for everybody else, it was, yeah. you know, yeah. It, it just shifted the balance of the book so it becomes like yeah. one story which is short and fun and surprising and interesting the akira endostatin story is good mm -hmm. but then doing it again and again is yeah so i sadly had to take it out but maybe for you know a next book or something well it sounds like you'd have an audience of uh, of, of me for that one because <laughs> because uh, i'm in this stuff because I, I worked on avastin uh, pre-launch right but you know maybe four four three four years pre-launch and um I didn't know anything that you were describing in that story and, uh, and you know, worked with the statin class for a while and uh, didn't know much of that kind of that, that, that story. So, yeah, but I think maybe let's start with that when we get into the book and, and why I think for the, the folks that I'm reaching, 
you know, they should be, you know, digging into this, uh, in, into your thoughts on innovation. Okay. And just when you say you worked on these products, uh, are they bringing you in on the kind of the, the marketing side, thinking yeah, about marketing so, strategy or regulatory or clinical or all of the above? So, yeah, a little bit. So we'd like to integrate the, all of that. So the regulatory commercial and, uh, and, uh, R, and therefore the R&D. So think about where you want the product to go. Think about how to be thinking about it. But um, our, our, our big thing at the moment is actually we talk about this kind of asymmetric learning, the planned serendipity. Um, so we're doing a kind of exploratory and then an exploitative phase so that people can think a bit harder about where the drug might work. Um, and it goes back to, you know, our, one of our hits like 20 years ago was Symbolta, where, um, you know, thinking about putting that into pain was important that it was done early, because if you'd done it later, you wouldn't have had any signal to go. So, um, so we're almost starting with that kind of, you know, the, the market place in mind and bringing that all the way back into, uh, into, into, you know, uh, thinking about what science, you know, and science you don't. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's in probably the number one most important lesson. Right. Uh, and we can talk about that. And I, uh, in fact, some of this project started on exactly that question 10 years ago. Okay. When yeah. Malcolm Gladwell gave a just sort of a funny talk on the, one of these moth events, which is a little storytelling 10 events. And he told just like this funny anecdote of when he was a journalist and sneaking some phrase into uh, the paper raises troubling uncertainties and mm -hmm. about the nature of serendipity or whatever. And he told this whole story and I came up to him and I didn't know him and I said, well, I think the failure to understand serendipity is the cause of the decline of a trillion dollar industry. So that okay. was 10 years ago. And Malcolm said to me, we were just at a little gathering after the event and he said, and you are who? And <laughs> Because uh, I just walked up to him, and it, we, it was just a little cocktail thing. And he said, "What?" And then he found out, you know, was, I meant that this human genome sequencing and the kind of over analysis and over prescriptive science was yeah. had led yeah. the pendulum to swing to missing the important role of serendipity, which it sounds like it's what you're talking about. Yeah. And that was behind the big. And so then Malcolm got fascinated and ended up interviewing me. Okay. Uh, every week for like the next two years, he would come over to my apartment and ask me stories and stories about drug discovery. And, and we ended up becoming friends. And then he ended up writing this article that was published in the New Yorker about biotech and me and drug discovery based on all that. And that got me kind of interested. And then boom, 10 years later, there's loon shots. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I see. That's interesting because I, I thought when I was looking at or listening to Martin Gladwell talk in a podcast recently, he was talking over it with some depth about biotech and Pfizer, and uh, I guess that's okay. you. Okay. Wow. Uh, he spent. <laughs> I think his the the woman who transcribes his notes said it was the longest series of tapes and notes, and because I just told stories, right? And he just loved the stories, and then he yeah. used a lot of them for his article. Yeah. Uh, it was about. We, it was about the ups and downs of one of our drug, the first drug that we were very excited about in the middle of the story, a phase three trial failed and uh, for that drug. And I remember coming up to him and said, hey, sorry about your story, because, sure. you know, you've been interviewing for almost a year or two years. And now we just got this like surprise announcement from the yeah. Yeah. Uh, data, re data review board. And then he came back to me a week later and said, actually, I think it's a better story. And so then he wrote the whole story about the ups and downs of that thing. And how oh, cool. And so that I wish, I, I wish I'd known. I'm sorry. I missed that. In, in no, no, no. I mean, that was like 2000. Uh, and yeah. I think it came out in 09 or 011. Oh, okay. so, I mean, okay. it was a long time ago. It feels like okay. yesterday, but it was a long time ago. Yeah. Well, it was 10 years ago. That's right. Interesting. He's got a new book coming out too, right? I think uh, next month, this month. Yeah, somewhere. Something, yeah. yeah, something like that. Um, okay, um, I may end up using what we just talked about anyway, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna start now just in case I, I miss some of this stuff as as we go. So.